Well, Bart, thank you so much for helping with my project. Uh, could we start off by you talking a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Bart Leahy. I am a technical writer, freelance technical writer. Uh, my background in space, I was a National Space Society member from 19, 1997 to 2011. Um, I've been uh, doing very, I've done various things in that line of work, um, writing documents, uh, citizen lobbying, running conferences, that kind of thing. Uh, that work for Mars Foundation, I've done work for Space Frontier Foundation. So in the I've been a space advocate, I've been a government space guy, I was at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, technical writer for them, for ARIES and uh, SLS for five, six years. And then I was a small business, supported a small business in Huntsville, Alabama, working for, who worked for both NASA and private space. So I got to work with like Golden Spike and Virgin and stuff like the Virgin Space and stuff like that. Now I'm freelancing and I'm doing, uh, one of the, working for one of the larger space, commercial space companies. I just won't let me tell you which one. So that's, that's my space background. Um, and like I said, I'm still very much a space person. Uh, just uh, it's one of the things I do now. And so I'm kind of curious, I, I don't know if this is something you're willing to talk about, but um, how come uh, you, you stopped being an SS member in 2011? Oh, um, I I'd done my time. It was just it was time to go. I had run, I think by the after I'd run a conference for them, I was I was kind of burned out. Oh, so, uh, is this like the ISDC? That would be the one. Yeah, I ran the one in Huntsville. So it was it was fine. It was just um, and I don't know what you're good to do with all this information. So I'll just leave it at it was time to go. I'd done, I done. I was really. It's a lot of work. It really is. And I was just kind of burned out after all that. So I just took a break from space advocacy, and now I just do very quiet behind the scenes thing like documents and whatever so I, it's it's interesting you say that um i actually started a uh nss chapter here in north houston called nss oh. uh, north houston space society oh, okay but uh occasionally i drive down to clear lake for their uh their their meetings and uh they mentioned that uh, they were quite a bit stronger before they hosted ISDC here in Houston. And they were, uh, they had commented that that's like the surest way to like really kill the chapter, <laughs> so. Well, you won't, you won't, well, you won't necessarily kill the chapter. I mean, uh, Hell 5 is still there in Huntsville. They're, they're that's still pretty strong because um, they've been there for since the 90s, early 90s um, at least. So um, it really, it's just, it takes a lot of effort and it takes, you, it causes a lot of stress <laughs> on occasion. So it's just, um, yeah, that's, uh, that would be why. I understand. Um, so Golden Spike, you know, whenever that came out, it seemed like it had all these people behind it and right. then like nothing. And I don't, I don't know what, I know, I honestly don't know what happened there. I, the, the company I worked for was doing engineering studies for them. Um, really high level systems engineering, like what would be the most effective combination of stuff, um, what would be the least expensive way to go to the moon commercially, that sort of thing. So that, that was, it was very high level stuff. But I, don't, I don't know, we did the study and then disappeared, they disappeared. So I don't know what happened with them. And uh, so when did you <clears throat> find out that we we're going to the moon in 2024? Weirdo, okay. Um, gosh, that must have been what, last year? Um, I remember hearing it and thinking, well, that's rather ambitious because in theory, we did it in 10 years the last time or eight years. Um, it's, I mean, I, it was doable. I, I, it's, it's doable. I just don't know if it's doable within the current regulatory framework. Oh, uh, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, well, <laughs> I probably should have asked you before I came into this. What, who uses this information? Where does it go? Um, oh, yeah, sure. I'd be more than happy to tell you about it. So um, you remember Doug Laverio had his um, little lapel pin counting day, down uh, the days to the end of 2024. Okay. And uh, he was, um, you know, he used to be the, the head of the human exploration and operations division. Uh, oh. Kind of, um, I, he had a go and now now Kathy is in, in charge. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, he was doing like this uh, HEO hero of the day where he would like nominate one person. And so back in December when he was doing that, I got this crazy idea of just asking everyday people 
about what they thought, if they knew about it, what they think about it, and you know, do they have an interest in going to space and kind of explore the uh, future of humanity in that. So my plan was to really go up to people at coffee shops and in the mall and, and the airports and, and things like that. And I record these videos and then put them unedited on my website, countdown to the moon.org. Okay. So it's like, um, uh, you know, that really, um, anyway, so I'm, I'm planning to do one a day to the end of 2024. <clears throat> and uh, of course, with the whole COVID-19 thing, uh, going up to people at the coffee shops um, uh, that you don't know, and trying to strike up a conversation is a little bit more perilous than uh, it used to be. So I kind of moved them uh, online um, and, you know, the nature of them changed a little bit because uh, generally speaking, the people that sign up for them are, are interested in space already. So you're not quite getting the full, uh, you know, kind of reaction you would out of the, um, uh, the people at the coffee shop and, and what have you. But it's been really interesting. Um, oh, good. All right. But yeah, um, as far as uh, uh, the, the current legal, regulatory framework, um, I still in the business, so I have to watch how I say things. Um, I'd say that um, there's a lot of the, the federal acquisition regulations to FAR are very prescriptive in what sort of things uh, government contractors have to do in order to build a piece of hardware, um, everything from how they, um, where they acquire the materials to who's doing it, to how many small businesses they work with. There's a lot of paperwork involved. And really the only way you can do, there's companies that can build stuff really fast and there's companies that can get through the paperwork and they're not always the same one. Um, so I, that's, that's challenging. Um, I, even Werner von Braun said something to be effective. You know, getting the moon is relatively easy. It's the paperwork, paperwork that kicks you in the butt. So um, it's hard. It's the paperwork, the legal, all the processes involved and all the meetings that they have to go through and all that. So I've, I've watched it from the government side as a, as a contractor at NASA and I've worked, seen it kind of from the position of a one of those contractors who's trying to get their, their, their rocket built. And it's really, it's challenging. There's a lot involved. There's so many moving parts to NASA and to the government and how they want things done. So it, it's not impossible. It's just, they're going to have to change how they do things. Like they'll have to do more of a space act thing if they want to get it, get it done than a, a far based contract. And so uh, what you're saying is like uh, Boeing and Lockheed uh, building the SLS and Orion, the bureaucratic overhead for them is much, much higher than say for Boeing with Starliner or SpaceX with uh, the Dragon, where they're really buying the end product as opposed to buying the implementation along the way. Yeah, I think that um, really uh, SpaceX are really tied to what's I guess, I, one that one, one thing I've heard it called is performance-based contracting, where basically you're just you're paying for the outcome. I want blah 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 payload on the moon, or I want three people on the moon, or I want blah, blah, blah amount of cargo given to the ISS, and you're not as concerned about how much, how it gets there. I mean, you're somewhat concerned. It's got to be legal and safe, but you're not there every minute. That you don't have people, inspectors, government-led inspectors every, in the process every step of the way. I mean, it's still, it's a lot different than that. Um, SpaceX, for example, has a lot of government help. There's a difference between, I think there's a, there's a difference between help and oversight. Oversight is you must do things our way and this is how you will do it. And then there's help where, hey, we don't know how to do this. Could you get us some assistance? So that's, there. but I'd say there's a lot more in the help. There's a lot more helping going on under the SpaceX and a lot less oversight. And, um, you know, of the people that I've talked to, you know, obviously the space advocates are all, knowledgeable of the the fact that we're trying to go to the moon in 2024 mm -hmm. some of them are skeptical and you know kind of think that it's it's unlikely we'll meet that date and what have you but mm -hmm. of the the non-space people i would say the vast majority of them have no clue that we're planning to go to the moon on 2024 and i was just curious what do you think it would take to to actually change that and is that important for them to know um 
you had to put actually you, you almost had to put someone there. You had to put a rocket on the pad and they go, hey, this, these people are going to the moon next week, and they'll be like, oh, really? Um, you know, <laughs> it, people really, they don't. Space takes a long time to do. I mean, it's hard, and it takes a long time for people to do it. So they're gonna. It's it's hard to pay keep, unless you're an advocate. And you're really into it. It's hard for you to pay attention and keep your keep the energy up. Um, I mean, the Apollo program was. They had something in the news all the time because there's always something new to do. And now it's the same, it's almost the same thing, but it's NASA's providing the money and the private companies are doing it. And a lot of it is off, off camera. So you don't see as much of it. So that's really, I think that's a lot of why there's so much less knowledge of it. And yes, there might be some people who are just like, yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Well, I mean, actually, now I almost think the problem is the opposite. There's so much going on that's disconnected from each other. It's really hard to put into some type of coherent story between commercial crew, International Space Station, you know, the Mars rover, um, you know, the commercial uh, lunar payload services programs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Starship being built, which talking about live cameras, that's one where you have 24 seven cameras and often commentary going on uh, in terms of what's going down there in Boca Chica, Texas. We're almost getting to the point where we could have a, a news, a space news TV network, almost, I think. Like, I know we've got, you know, blogs, you know, like, um, there's a lot of really good blogs and space news people out there you can almost round them up and go okay hey you want to build you know the smn you want to build the space news network and start having because there's enough there's really is a, enough material now just as you see all the stuff you pointed out i, I mean yeah you can even have your uh, reality show with like a private space station and <laughs> <laughs> there and, there was a guy out there who wanted to do a reality show on Sending two people, putting two people in a phone booth size thing out to Mars, not phone booth, but anyway, a rather small container out to Mars and back. And I, uh, no, <laughs> that's really the wrong environment. Because they, those shows are all about increasing drama and increasing tension and jeopardy. And that's absolutely the wrong thing you want to do in a space environment. I mean, maybe when it's safe enough, you can do some cute stuff that won't get people immediately killed sure but no not right now not, not, not while people are still learning how to do it yeah indeed uh that that is uh true in fact we're trying to reduce the drama in space not increase it exactly i mean and that's there's wonderful things like the use of the word nominal which bores me um uh, but it's that's what the, the, when it's very complex very dangerous hardware is going to do all these complex things at one time and it's going to work as close to perfect as we can get it that's nominal they narrow, they narrow all that excitement down to one word, nominal, and it, it drives me crazy. You, need, you want excitement, you want interest, you want to, it, uh, some sense of adventure. You just don't want people, you don't want it to be fake drama. You don't want enforced drama. You know, I, don't want, I really don't care about, you know, Controller A has got a personal beef with per Controller B. I don't care. I really don't. But I do, you know, it, I'm interested in the problems they're working on. That would be interesting. I'd love to know more about that. Yeah, it'd be, uh, you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking back to Ernest Shackleton's uh, trip to the, uh, you know, South Pole. Mm -hmm. or, uh, and I was just thinking about how different that would have been with today's technology instead of them going down there and, and kind of, you know, surviving a year in like really harsh conditions and coming back and, you know, sharing that story, having to keep up their Twitter feed and Facebook uh, things. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, put stuff on Instagram and right. It's day one fifty five. We're still on the ice. Yeah, yeah. the sun, the sun still has not peaked above the horizon. It's minus fifty. I'm freaking cold. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like there's things that we could see behind the scenes. I think that I think would make it more interesting. Like listening, I've gotten. I've done some space journalism. That's another thing I forget left off my resume. But um, I've been so I've been in the control rooms, like during rehearsals and stuff, and being able to listen in on the comm channels. You know, because they'll maybe run one channel, the main the main the main feed just before just before tape uh, lift off. But they won't listen. You won't be able to listen to like the hours or two ahead when they're working on the fixing problems. And that's really interesting to me. And I, I, I really wish uh, NASA would share more of that. 
is that like okay, that's that's a real problem. How do how do they fix that? That you know okay, that's not drama in the uh, emotional sense of the word, but it's drama in a pertinent human sense because you're still trying to fix a problem before something bad happens. Yeah, e exactly. But um, what do you what do you think about the 2020s in terms of regards to space? Um, I keep thinking. I mean, they feel a bit to me like what the 1990s were to the internet. Like, uh, whenever we get to 2030, our ideas about what's normal and routine and our capacity of what we could do in space will be forever changed. But I'm not sure if, if, if maybe that's a false hope or if it's, it's shared by others in the space community. Um, that might be a good analogy. Um, but really, it, took, it still took another 10 years for the internet to really do things that we consider that are um, part of our lives, like Facebook on the phone or whatever. Um, Facebook or Twitter, those being just regular parts of our lives. I think we're still 20 years away from that. But 10 years, yeah, 10 years, we could, we'd have, you know, it's conceivable to be having regularly operating commercial space ports and regularly operating commercial space lines, more than one, which would be exciting. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot to keep up with. I think the COVID, I'm afraid COVID is slowing everything down. It really is because you've got to be in the room working on hardware. And if they're not going to put, you know, if they're going to send all the engineers home to work from home, they're not going to, you know, make the technicians who are working on the hardware, not, you know, I don't know. There, it's, it's slow. It's definitely put a kink in the process for at least a year, I think, maybe longer. Hmm. But I mean, a lot of the hardware is being worked on in clean rooms where they're, you know, they have to don um, pretty much protective equipment anyway. True, true. Um, it depends. Well, yeah, it depends. The big stuff, I mean, the, the really big stuff is not like, I mean, the well, the stuff they're putting on welders and whatever. But it's, um, that, that has been a big disappointment for 2020. <laughs> for everybody, I'm sure, including you, I'm sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, I think um, well, a lot of exciting stuff coming. It'll be fun to see um, more than one space space line out there. It'll be nice to see Virgin finally flying. Nice to see Blue Origin flying. Nice to see, well, if they ever do anything with uh, Strata Launch, or you know, that the, the big airplane. So plenty to be plenty to be seen. Plenty to be thought thought about. Uh, indeed. Um, so in in twenty thirty. Like uh, using your most optimistic projection, what do you think it would be like uh, from a space access to space standpoint, and like the number of people in space, and oh gosh, and, you know most that <laughs> most optimistic might be uh, you know we might have people on the moon, um, more people in orbit, not just ISS but commercial. Um, more than one space, like I said, more than one space line. Um, you might have start, you might have, obviously I'm thinking by that, by 2030, uh, Starship should have at least gone somewhere. You know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, and like I said, by that point, the origin will have got stuff out there. So there's, and SLS will be out there. So there will be three rockets up there operating by 2030, which is pretty exciting. Because that's there's a whole lot more you can do with one three types of rockets than you can with just one. And that's just the U.S. side. I mean, China right. has their plans. Yep, yep. Um, India wants to by India wants to put uh, astronaut in space, um, and that so that be, that could have happened by 2030. So yeah, lot, lots of exciting, lot of exciting stuff happening. I do think like the number of people in space is. Uh, more or less than 20 simultaneously. But 2030 still might be, might be less. Um, it might be near 20. Like if you count for number of people on ISS, number of people on the moon, number of people in a commercial space station or something or in another country space station. Um, but I don't, I've, I've learned to become more commercial, uh, commercial, more conservative in my, out, my uh, prognostications because I've discovered how very long this does take to get it right. I gotta wonder though, um, whenever computing was just getting started and you mm -hmm. had like the big 
um, mainframes and, you know, it would literally take like years to build a computer and, uh, you know, people had to learn so much just to get these simple calculations done. Um, I mean, just the transformation from that to like the personal computer and how how that became. It seems to me that if Elon is successful with his Starship and it's even half of what he, he hopes it will be, mm -hmm. that that will be that similar type of transformation. Right? Yeah, I mean, the lowering, lowering the cost, a lot of that is a function of uh, mass production. So yeah, absolutely. And when you look out, say 500 years, way out in the future, I know. <laughs> yeah. um, do you do you think we're still on Earth making these little short trips into space, or do you think we've fundamentally been able to expand beyond the Earth? Oh, beyond Earth in five hundred years, that that that's easy. Um, how far beyond the Earth is another question. Um, I mean, we could we could moon and Mars on asteroids or within asteroids. Sure, um, I've seen read about turning hollowing out asteroids, spinning them up, and filling, turning those into space stations, uh, or even into spacecraft. So you could have, I mean, you could have us all through the solar system in 500 years, easy, uh, out, to, um, out to Pluto. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, beyond that, I, that, that, I'm not that uh, creative a thinker. <laughs> I'm, much, I'm fascinated by reading about it, but I don't, you know, I don't, my own, ability to see the future is pretty limited. But, yeah. um, I guess, you know, it seems to me that um, in terms of developing the skills and the vision and the what have you that we need to actually become spacefaring, it seems to me that um, people are becoming much, much more isolated and specialized in their little part of knowledge and that you know, increasingly people are working with uh, technologies that they are unable to inspect or understand. And I, I was just wondering if, if this caused you any type of concern in terms of will this limit our ability to actually continue the upward progression of uh, technology or is it just something that's just the part of, of I mean, like what's, what's inhibiting us from um, expanding beyond the earth from a development of people standpoint and well, that's certainly I think you asked two different questions there as far as um, how we specialize that's that's going to continue to happen I mean it's getting harder it's it's impossible for one person to know what, all, all, everything that's going on in science and technology you might I mean even just knowing everything that's going on in science everything that's going on in technology either one of those fields is too big it's too big now you might be able to get a general perspective on it and say, you know, I can be a visionary and see what we can do with these things to get put together. And I'd love to see a little bit more of that general, generalist technolo technology thinking. Um, as far as what's holding us back from doing more in space, um, it's time and money, really. Um, yeah, there's only so many hours in the day, there's only so many people working on it. Uh, eventually you're going to run out of people who are true believers and you have to start hiring people to work for um, who just want it for the job. Um, and there's there's some political, it's not as much as there used to be. There's a, there's a lot of political resistance to the idea of things like commercial commercial space stations or commercial or companies like Elon going out to the moon. Um, there would have been, I think, even five or ten years ago, a lot more resistance to that idea. Like, oh my gosh, we can't have that happening. No, no, no. Now I think it's, you know what, it's his money, go do it. Because I don't want to pay my tax dollars to send somebody. There are, I know people like this, so this is, it's not a, it's not a stretch. Um, yeah, really, it's, it's, it's time and money. It's um, who's got the time, who's got the money, and who's willing to spend it. And then there's, and, and that could be a government, it could be a private individual, it could be a conglomerate. Um, but it's, 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 it's there's a lot more people getting into it now. It's really, it's, it's been amazing to watch because I watched, um, there was a big upsurge in the, in the late 1990s, um, companies you probably even haven't heard of, uh, Kistler Aerospace and um, some others that were supposed to be what Elon is doing now. They were talking about reusable rockets you know, in the 1990s. 
and it never went anywhere. Well, now they're actually building the stuff. So it's a lot of stuff we, they were talking about 20, 30 years ago, they're now actually doing. So it's really it's exciting. And, you know, like you mentioned, a lot of those companies we didn't hear of, they kind of petered out and, yeah. and stuff. Um, I do think uh, this time around is going to be any different. Oh, yeah, because they're actually building hardware. They got the money. They're doing it. Um, it's, and that's been because, I mean, the folks I was running into at my first ISDC were people who were like, still look, they were asking people, they're looking for money. They're looking for investors. Uh, they didn't have the deep pockets of uh, an Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos to be able to go, you know, I've got $3 billion here. Let's build a rocket. Let's build the whole spaceport that goes with it. Let's build the infrastructure. Let's build the, all that stuff. It, it, there were no billionaires that were funding it in 1990. Now there are. That's, that's just, I think that's just the big difference. And so, yeah, I think it'll, it's sticking. Um, and fortunes of companies can rise and fall, but I think just the fact that the hardware already exists, if, you know, if Elon dies tomorrow, somebody will buy his stuff and keep building it because it's so good and because it's working and because it's moving the state of the art forward. So, it, yes, it's going to stick. I, that'd be a, uh... That'd be exciting. Um, so if it was safe and affordable, would you have any interest in going into space? <laughs> For 10 years ago, I would have said yes. I've worked with the stuff so much now, I don't know if I would. Safe and affordable, yes. Safe to with it, what levels? You know, how, how much has it been tested? How many, much has it been flowed? Do I want to be first? No. <laughs> um, I'm not a test pilot. I'm a commercial, I'm, you know, I'm, you know I'm, the only way they're going to get me in the space is if I'm a tourist. I know that I'm not an engineer, I'm not an astronaut. Um, so as a tourist, sure, I, if I can afford it, yeah, I'd go. Um, but there's, uh, I'd have to, uh, I'm really sit back and watch people, like it took me five or 10 years later after everybody else to get a cell phone. I'm much slower on uh, being an adopter of technology. I'm interested in watching it and studying it, but actually participating in going in myself, yeah, no. <laughs> And I'm, you know, I, I love my friends who are like gung ho. They want to go tomorrow, and you put them on whatever rocket. They be like, I'm in, and great. Those are the adventurers. Those are the people you send first anyway. You send me after things have settled down a little bit, and you just need some documentation written. You know, that's <laughs> well, and you know, uh, safety is a, a slippery concept, right? Um, yeah. Uh, but I, I think one way to think about it, uh, I guess. Uh, one way to think about it is how many people need to go successfully without incident before you, you know, is that like 10 people, a hundred people, a thousand, 10,000, 10, a couple, couple tens of thousands, a couple hundred thousand, maybe, you know, I don't, I really don't know. I don't think it's going to, I might be a couple of tens of thousands. If it was in my lifetime, it would have to be a couple of tens of thousands. Um, and I'd let how many, and I don't know how many flights of those were there accidents, were there problems, you know, like how big a problem. So I've, right now, I'm in no danger of going into space because then number one, I can't afford it. Number two, the, the, they're not doing it yet. They're not even doing it yet. So they're about, I don't know, you're, they seem to be, it's always, it, the, the good news is about this whole business is that it used to be, it was always 10 years away. We're going to have tourism in 10 years. Well, now I think the, the, the horizon shrunk from like 10 to five to within a year or two. I mean, they keep saying it every year, you know, it's gonna, within a year, Virgin's going to fly and uh, that kind of thing, and uh, well, maybe not. So, but I think within five years, that's I can see that happening. And with it, me going after the after, you know, when it first happens five years from now, great. I'm all I'll be cheering on, cheering the whole thing on. Uh, Ten or twenty years after that, if they still allow a person that old to fly, I might give it a thought. Hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and it's kind of interesting. I mean, I've asked a lot of people that question. You know, people that are afraid to fly, of course, they don't want to go to space. Oh, yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> and, there, you know, there's some people um, that are fine with flying, but uh, they just, you know, kind of uncomfortable with the idea and what have you. Um, well, I guess, uh, was there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to? Um. <clears throat> <laughs> I, I'm going to be very careful here because, I, like I said, I, work, I still work for NASA and I still might work for them again in the future. But I think there's, while NASA is so focused on SLS and Orion long term, they've got to be focusing on other things as well. The, um, and like lunar habitats or inter, in space propulsion, things that can really move 
the ball forward in space to other destinations, make the loon start with a lunar uh, base. Um, I'm, not a fan, I'm not a fan of the gateway, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna lose that battle. Um, <laughs> you know, things that, but I, I, there's, NASA has, uh, like when it was the NACA before it was NASA, it was focused on building hardware to test new concepts of aviation like new plane, the X, all the X planes, like X1 through X15 or whatever, all those planes that were testing new types of hardware. Um, there's still things that NASA could be doing in that realm that they should be doing that would make, you know, that, that would be for the benefit of everybody. Like, so they, NASA funds the project, somebody builds the hardware, and then the knowledge is spread throughout the community so that everybody learns, oh, if you build a, in that shape like this, you'll get better results than if you, you know, use something else. So it's all that funding, all that fundamental engineering knowledge is something NASA was designed to do. And I really think it's should be doing that more of that in the future, just to make like either the new the, the new tools, the new hardware, or also the destinations to like to provide. Like with ISS, ISS has now provided the the base of the location for uh, Earth to orbit transportation to become a reality. Well, okay, then the next step is you build one out to out on the moon and you start doing com commercial flights out to the moon. And while they're doing that, NASA builds the next thing out on, the, on Mars or an asteroid and they, the process continues. Government at the, at the cutting edge and then commercial sector following up. Once it's been proven it can be done reliably and safely. So I really think that's long term, that's where it's going to have to go. Um, and it's been really interesting to because I remember having these discussions, like I said, 20, 30 years ago, and it's really interesting to watch it happen now. I mean, the government really has proven, okay, here's what can be done. Now the commercial sector needs to take over. The commercial is taking over. It's, it's marvelous to watch. So. It did. And uh, in terms of like actual colonization of space, Mm -hmm. Do you think NASA is ultimately the organization that's going to enable that, or are you seeing something else coming up? Oh, no. Uh, no. Uh, I mean, NASA could set up a, like, a, equivalent to ISS, a, a scientific station on the moon, but they need cargo sent up there. Um, and then eventually, you know, somebody might want to build an observatory on the far side. And then, so you might, you'll start with the science, and then you have people there, so you're going to need to feed them. And they're going to get bored. They're going to want entertainment, and they're going to want, you know, their families to visit them. So you're going to need hotels, and you know, it'll build up. Those science bases can be built up, can be the cores of other things to build up around them. So the government will start be the, the basic, tiny seed corn, and then everything else builds up around it. And what do you think about space force? You think that is a step in the right direction, or? Um, it's kind of like the Air Force being split off of the Army back in the day. Um, it was because I think the, well, when Air Force was formed, if I understanding, understand it correctly, um, there were people who didn't, Army generals didn't understand airplanes. They were focused on the ground. In the same way, the Air Force, I think, might be focused on bombers or fighters or drones in the atmosphere. Not all of them, I, there are obviously, We've got our, we've had space stuff, we've been handling space since then. But I think there's space, it's just another discipline. It'd be another, another domain that, that would, could be logically split off. So I think that's, it's not unreasonable. Um, a lot of politics involved and that's partly the people proposing it, but um, the, 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 the idea is sound, the organization, I think, the, the justifications for it are sound. There's, there's things they could be doing, like uh, looking at asteroid defense, that would be kind of fun and necessary. But that, that would be something I would think a space force would do, rather than NASA. Yeah, and um, in terms of international organizations, oh, or, I mean, do you think that we have the right level of international collaboration or uh, should there be some changes made there? Well, I mean, there's, we've got a really, an amazing thing going with the ISS. Um, I was on the previous telecon and they were talking about uh, nominating the International Space Station for a Nobel Peace Prize, 
which is a marvelous idea. I hadn't thought about that, but I, mean, I don't know who you give the award to, but it's really, it's, it's been just an amazing, system. regardless of how we've been getting along with our various partners, Russia or Europe or whoever, we've still kept that thing occupied, funded, communicated with, fed, repaired for 20 years. And that's, real, that's just amazing. That's really, that's a testament to the, pro, the strength of the process. Um, and you would have to, I think, extend that process out to the space, which is what that previous telecom was about, extending international cooperation that's been developed on ISS to the moon and beyond. So that's, yeah. I mean, I think that would be a, a reasonable way to do it, at least as far as government projects go. Uh, and one benefit of international cooperation and agreement that I've heard is that it helps to provide some stability to these programs uh, by having external commitments. It, it makes it harder to make um, lots of changes to them. Yeah, it's also harder to back out. It's like, look, we've already got uh, England and the Netherlands and Germany always signed up to build hardware. We can't say no to them now. You know, it's it's a cute little game of political gamesmanship, and it works. Um, not always, but most of the time it works. Um, so yeah, um, it's it, it it does kind of force it, it forces the process to stay apolitical as much as possible at more uh, national national level, which is I think the less part of them. Now, um, in terms of this project. Um, one of the ways I think about it is as a time capsule. Um, I envision a high school student 50 years, 100 years, 200 years from now, mm -hmm. having to write a paper about what were people thinking of right before the beginning of the new space age. Okay. <laughs> um, what would you say to that student? They're going to be like, why are these people all talking about this COVID thing? What's so big about COVID? Because um, really, it's 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 consumed everything. It has consumed our culture. It's consumed our technology. It's consumed our economy, our our politics. Um, I think it's it it just by its presence and how we've reacted to it has been really almost toxic in some ways to how how what kind of progress we can make um, on a mul in multiple levels. So I think that's that how we respond to that and how we do, how we end up eventually coming out of it will determine how well we do in space eventually. Because right now, I mean, you know, you're in a cl enclosed space. People are afraid to go to the movie theater right now because it's an enclosed space. What's, what's a space capsule? It's gonna be, a, you know, something the size of this apartment maybe, you know, for months at a time. Are they gonna be worried about, you know, COVID? Right now, that's, I, I don't think anybody's thinking about it. They're just hoping that we all go back to normal. But what if we don't go back to normal? You know, that's, so it really has, it, it's shifted my thinking quite a bit, um, trying to understand, envisioning the future. It's much harder. Yeah, it, it's, and it also challenges our uh, notion of uh, freedoms and, and lots of other things. Um, my mother used to tell me that your, your right to swing your arms uh, ends uh, when you hit somebody else, you know, <laughs> like, and, but if you're all like jammed up uh, together, then of course you could swing your arms less. But now it's like just the mere act of breathing can have an impact on somebody else. So where does freedom, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, well, where is that in, in that situation? Yeah, I mean, I'd like, I really want to see that. I want to see this succeed. I want to see, and I'm, I work for one of the companies that, got an award, so I'm not gonna say which. I'm, I'm, and I'm, therefore I'm not gonna comment on a lot of the hardware. Things I could comment, I'm not gonna comment on. But I think um, there's some really interesting opportunities out there, some really interesting approaches to be had, to be done, to make a human landing possible in a shorter amount of time, based on what we learned, you know, 50 years ago. So yeah, it's, it's exciting, I'd like to, I'd like to see it happen in 2024. I'm not going to hold my breath, but I'd like to see it happen. Yeah, as long as we keep making progress. I mean, if we could do that, uh, astronauts around the moon, that would be yeah. amazing. Exactly. Just just as a just as a starting point, get people back there, get people thinking again in terms of a bigger world than just this one, because I think that's that that has a lot to do with um, some of our stresses down here. If you th if you think that this is all we've got, you're much more likely to fight over it because it's mine it's one ply it's one piece it's one world we've got to fight over because it's mine and if you got it then i don't have it it's all it's a one's 
it's a zero sum game. If you've got other places you can go like to get useful materials or other places people can live or other, you know, that sort of thing, you've got a better opportunity to expand what's possible. And people aren't as focused on the zero sum pie because the pie has gotten bigger. There's more places to go. Yeah. And a lot of people think that's um, fantasy thinking. Uh, what do you think it would take to kind of move the needle so that they actually are like, you know, you're right. We have the entire universe. <laughs> well, heck, just the solar system would be a good start. Um, I think you'd have to, and once you got people, and I, I, was, I was excited when they started doing asteroid mining companies a couple years ago and they kind of disappeared. But I, I think when, they, when money starts being made from rocks in space, either an asteroid or mining the moon or something, and it comes back to Earth for a real product or a real just material on itself. Like we start mining platinum group metals on the moon, congratulations. We've now got a substitute for all the stuff we were strip mining here on Earth. When we start doing that kind of stuff, it will shift, it'll, it'll shift the, the, the consciousness a little bit. Now, there's some people I've talked to that are like, you know, we've messed up the earth. Why we mess up the moon too? <laughs> yeah, I know. And so uh, how, how, do you, how do you address that? Well, I'd say, okay, look, we're, this is not Earth 1970 when we really needed an Earth Day and the river, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland was burning and there was black smoke coming off. You couldn't see Manhattan some days. We're not there. We've improved over 50 years. And we continue to improve and we continue to make things better because as we learn more, we, you know, we learn, we're not just learning how to clean up what we, the messes we made, we learn how to make things better so they don't pollute. We learn, we understand what the secondary effects of our manufacturing are going to be. So we learn, okay, we've got to um, automatically account for that in how we build things. That's, a, that's, a, that's been a shift of thinking thanks to Earth Day and which was thanks to Apollo 8, um, people seeing the Earth from the moon. Um, I, yeah, that's. We, it's not as it is not as bad as it was in 1970, and it is despite the fact that there's more people. There's not. I mean, there's. I mean, we still got problems. We've got plastic in the ocean. I want that gone. You know, there's. Um, we've still got the ozone hole. Not as bad. That's been fi That's been reducing over the past 30 years. So, you know, we we're conscious of it, and we're doing things about it. And the richer a world you've got the better we are able to cope with it. The poorer you make the world, the less likely we are gonna be able to fix the problems that we've made with our pollution. That makes sense to me. You can hope. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, I, I'll have to check out that Artemis Accord uh, a conference you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I don't even know what time it is. Um, let's see, it is 2.30, oh, they, they're probably done by now. But anyway, it's, it, uh, they, they were gonna have, um, they, they started sharing um, information about basically the, the pr statement of principles that they were gonna try to abide by among all these par participants in Artemis. So things like, uh, what? <laughs> I think like interoperable. Well, like, abiding by the space treaty, um, my uh, sharing information, um, being uh, abiding by things like the uh, um, uh, distressed space space person clause, uh, distressed astronaut clause, where you've got an, you know responding to emergencies. You know, astronaut from plant com country A is stranded on the moon. Who's closest? Go get you know, go help. That kind of thing. So, and or don't uh, things like uh, don't. Uh, don't be violating, don't be polluting, don't be ter trashing um, heritage sites. Like don't go landing your, uh, your own lander on the Apollo 11 site just to kick things around. That's rude, you know, that's rude. So there's, there's, but it should be, it's a good, it's a good start. It's, it's part of that whole working together framework. They're just, again, trying to expand what they've done with ISS to the moon. Should be fun. Awesome. It's going to be a great uh, future, great decade. Indeed, that, that's that's the whole that's the plan, so go go get them. You're you're the young person. You make it happen. I just write about it. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, you have a good day. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye.